Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jay Chin. Um, I'm part of the infrastructure engineering team at OpenTable, uh, where I lead the um, SRE team there. Um, so, just a bit of a background about me. Um, I used to come from financial services. Anyone from financial services here? No, nope, one, two, no, nope, maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, and when I came to OpenTable, um, it was sort of a culture shock for me. Um, back in the uh, banks that I used to work with. So I, I worked with uh, Compute Grid, um, lots of calls, um, running risk calculations overnight, um, a shared grid um, that's used by different teams in the bank. And whenever we introduced some sort of middleware, there was always resistance. Um, um, development teams were very highly resistant to change. Um, I don't want to move to this new middleware. Um, but it was the exact opposite at OpenTable. Um, when I joined OpenTable, um, um, I mean, I think it was in the uh, second week when Team Sim came to me and said, I want to move to Mesos. Um, when, when can you help us do that? I mean, we we, we want to make those code changes. We want to move to Mesos immediately. And I was shocked. Um, and when I dug into it, um, it was not just the uh, technology. Of course, Mesos is great, but it was the uh, things that we built around Mesos that sort of uh, made the um, transition so much smoother for the development teams and everyone wanted to jump on to Mesos. So I'm here today to share with you guys on what we did to make Mesos great and open table and why our developers um, and engineers love uh, Mesos so much. Okay, so some numbers. Um, I guess, um, how, how many of you actually use open table? One, two, three. Um, it's it's not that big in Europe. Uh, it's quite big in North America. I mean, that's that's our biggest market. Um, we're going to be 20 years uh, next year, so it's a it's not a startup. It's quite an old company. Um, we've done about 1.4 uh, billion online reservations. Um, we do about 2.3 million diners per month. Um, we have 58 million verified reviews on restaurants. Um, so it's a, if you're not booking through Open Table. It's also a great place to go to look for restaurant reviews. Um, we have 43,000 restaurants um, globally. Um, and then I think the uh, stats from 2017 showed that 55% of all our reservations that we take come from mobile devices. Um, our business day is, can anyone guess what's the uh, business day? No. Valentine's Day, all right. Um, I mean, we get like 500 to 600 searches per second. Um, some stats on Valentine's Day, 43% um, of all the uh, reservations on Valentine's Day was the week leading up to the uh, holiday. So, you know, most people book, you know, um, if Valentine's Day is next week, most people book this week. Um, last year, we had uh, something really unique. Um, the earliest reservation for 2016 Valentine's Day came on the 2015 Valentine's Day. You know, that's dedication, right? Maybe that guy had a bad experience booking a restaurant, but yeah. You know, anyway, um, so um, what does our tax stack look like? Well, being being an old company, we used to run everything before 2013 as a single single .NET monolithic application. Uh, it was a shared code base. Um, all the applications um, contributed to the shared code base. Um, it was single tech stack across all our data centers globally. Um, every two, three months or so, when we do a release, it sort of looked like the uh, uh, NASA command center. All hands on deck, right? All the uh, operations team, development teams, everyone was there because this was going to be a big release, right? We've worked two or three months, put in those features. Let's do a big bang deployment now. You know, if things go wrong, maybe we can fix the uh, bugs, you know, make the release go well. So everyone was there. Um, looking at metrics, everything while we did the uh, deployment. Um, sometimes things go well. Uh, sometimes uh, didn't go that well, right? So developer could be working on a feature for two or three months, and then if something went wrong, which was no fault of his own, right? Someone introduced a bug, his features had to be rolled back, and that's probably him there, <laughs> right? Um, so um, what we did to solve this problem was around 2013, um, we moved to SOA, right? So we split up the uh, big monolith into individual services. 
Um, so as you can see, we have this big website. Um, although it looks like a single website, there's, um, there's different features of the sites there. For example, search, reviews, emails, all this was split into different services. Um, and it was great because we told the developers, now split yourself into teams, use whatever technology you like, um, do whatever you want, um, feel free, go wow, right? Um, and developers just went out there, um, you know, sort of looked at bleeding edge technology. So we have .NET, we have um, uh, Node.js, we even had Clojure. Um, we had everything there because they were microservices, it was fine, right? Um, they sort of didn't depend on a single shared code base. Um, and then with this came independent release of features and services um, from a two-month release cycle. Uh, now we had thousands of deployments to production a week. Um, so um, product features could come out really, really fast. Um, there was good iteration there. Um, and the product teams were really happy with what we did because now you know they, they could um, instead of a two-month release cycle for product features, it sort of, sort of um, shortened it down to one or two weeks, so which was great. Um, and how did we host those services was through virtualization. So you can think of each of those services um, running on its own host as a single virtual machine. Um, so you can see there, data center, you know, all those VMs running in those data centers. And it was okay. Um, uh, the developers had to write a bit of puppet code to get those virtual machines up and running. Um, um, and then, when it came to scaling, all we needed to do was just to clone the uh, VMs. Simple, all right? Uh, but by the end of 2013, I think we had around 1,200 VMs running around on all our data centers. So, loads of virtual machines. Um, the infrastructure teams, uh, which is the team that I'm with, infrastructure engineering, though, had a different viewpoint on what was happening. So that, that's us, the day in the life of us. This is what we were doing, herding cats all day. It's because everyone was um, doing things on their own. Uh, there was no standardization. Everyone had their own logging. Some people had their own metrics. Some people even wrote puppet code to create their own logging cluster, for example, their own metrics collection cluster. Uh, we spent most of our day actually just reviewing um, Puppet infrastructure code. How many of you have done Puppet here? Do you like it? Raise your hand to anyone who likes writing Puppet code. Right. So it's even worse for developers, right? Because I think switching from actually developing um, in your app to actually doing Puppet code is sort of like contact switching. And um, we had Puppet Code to do everything. So not just bringing up virtual machines, but also monitoring, metrics, everything, everything was done through Puppet. Um, infrastructure as code, right? Um, so infrastructure engineering felt, you know, we were sort of to blame for you know, introducing this. Um, this is what the whole um, development life cycle looked like uh, from a developer's point of view. So there were four stages there. Uh, local build, provision, metrics monitoring. In the uh, local build, developers wrote code. Um, then they had to write infrastructure code to actually um, test it in the their local environment. So every, all the uh, developers actually pulled out the uh, central Puppet repository and then wrote infrastructure Puppet code to actually bring up uh, a virtual machine instance that would run their code. So uh, things like dependencies and you know um, extra services like writing cron jobs, for example, everything had to be written by the uh, developers to to get this done. Um, once they have tested this on a local Vagrant build, so we use Vagrant, um, they would actually raise a review to the infrastructure teams to actually push push this out into production. So infrastructure teams they daily reviewing all those um, infrastructure code. Um, once, once it goes into production, um, it's only then that you can actually provision those VMs out into our data centers. Um, I think our Puppet code, code base grew up to about one gigabyte of source code. That's how big it became, right? Because everyone was doing something different. Um, and um, same with the uh, metrics part, right? Um, it was also Puppet code. Um, everything was controlled through Puppet. 
uh, monitoring was the same. Um, but the good thing is everything's viewable as code, right? Infrastructure is code, everything's there. Um, so you, our developers, this, this is how they felt about Puppet. Um, <laughs> so something had to change. Um, around 2014, um, we started to look at Mesos. Um, and we explored the uh, possibility of, instead of using VMs, we could actually run them as uh, Mesos services. Well, that solved a few problems. So it, instead of uh, writing Puppet code to deploy um, um, virtual machines on your own environment into our data centers, now this is how the uh, development lifecycle looked like after we had Mesos. So look at the uh, purple boxes. It's blue here. Purple boxes up there. Um, now, all they need to do is, after the right code, um, local Docker testing, push it to a Docker repo, and then all they needed to do was push this Docker images into um, the various Mesos clusters. So we have um, a few Mesos clusters, some running in the cloud, some running on-premise, um, they're globally. Um, so there's, we have data centers in London, we have data centers in um, the United States. Um, so each service had to deploy to one of those data centers. Um, um, the uh, metrics part of things um, will still remain the same. They still had to write puppet code. Uh, monitoring was the same. Um, now, looking at this, the infrastructure team thought, um, OK, um, let's see what we can do with metrics. Perhaps we could standardize the way metrics are collected, since everyone is in, on Mesos now. Um, all the uh, metrics, we could get most of the uh, metrics to the APIs, for example, Mesos APIs, the uh, Singularity APIs, so we use Singularity as the uh, scheduler. And we design a metrics pipeline. Um, so we wrote something called Mesostats, it's open source, uh, your URLs here, um, that collected stats from Mesos. It goes into Singularity, it goes into Mesos, um, collects those metrics, uh, pumps them into a Kafka queue, um, and then it goes into a graphite cluster. Um, anyone use graphite out there? Yep, lots of graphite users. I love graphite. Um, the amount of metrics we pumped in was so much that we had to change the default carbon relay, as you can see there. It's a carbon C relay. Do you guys use carbon C relay? Yeah, it's great if you run into performance issues. Um, you know, it's a um, to replace it with carbon C relay. And then we had Grafana as the uh, front end where you know, all the uh, dashboards were made. Um, one significant thing that we did with Graf Grafana is to use Grafana lib. Um, what we did was we created templates for dash dashboards. So any application team that started using Mesos would get a dashboard created automatically for them. Um, so that would be a nice, so to start running in Mesos, you get a dashboard that shows your CPU usage, memory, and various other stats, all for free. You know, you don't even have to touch a thing. Um, the other nice thing that we did with the Grafana dashboards is not just put graphs, but to actually put text. So you can't see the uh, text there, but it does explain what those graphs mean. So if something is created automatically for you, uh, most of the time you don't realize or don't even know what it is. So we had to have text in there because all this was templatized. Um, and developers were really, really happy because, you know, deploy a service in Mesos, I get this dashboard, I even get help text that tells me what those dashboards are. Um, so everything was automated. Um, the other thing that helped with those dashboards was resource usage. So this is an example singularity task, um, which, which requests 256 megabytes of memory. Um, on those dashboards, we actually show the uh, requests as well as the actual use. So the request is in red. The actual use is in yellow down there. So you can see memory has been over provisioned for this box. Like, and the orange graph there is a recommendation from the infrastructure teams. This is probably what you should change it to, right? So, so a lot of new developers, especially new ones, would just put random numbers, 256 megabyte of memory, 0 0.1 CPU, or sometimes you know, 
I need more CPU, one C, uh, 1.0 CPU. But those ran random, s n those numbers are actually quite random. You know, I'll just come up with some number and I'll just use them. But they actually involve wastage on our resources. Uh, so having this sort of graphs actually does a bit of governance on you know the actual resource that are being used, um, and our finance team really liked it because it saved quite a lot of money. <laughs> right, um, so everyone, uh, all the uh, resource usage was optimized. Um, the other thing that we could get from those metrics and usage graphs was uh, right sizing in our cloud instances. So, for example, changing from R3 instances to M4 instances, actually M4 to R3 instances saves us 20% of our cloud usage costs. But it's all about having those metrics, common metrics, and be, being able to make sense of those metrics that you can make those informed decisions. Now, after, those, after the uh, automated dashboards, this was what the development lifecycle looked like. Um, so we've automated the uh, top bar. The, uh, the only optional metrics that needed to be done was if some application had some custom metric that they want to be sent. For example, say JVM heap size, for example. So, so that they would probably need to write extra code to do. But all the uh, base health and welfare, like CPU, memory, Everything was done automatically. Um, so we start. So the infrastructure teams then started to look a bit more into this, and we had the uh, final piece of the uh, puzzle there to solve in terms of monitoring. Um, and we also look at the above the way um, our developers were doing deployments, and we wanted to make things a bit better, as usual. Um, so we developed something called Su. Um, it's open source too. Um, wh wh what it is, is a global deployment um, tool that we use internally. Um, and um, what it does is it abstracts out all the uh, cluster information. So all the developer needs to do now is to write code, um, do a SU deploy, um, that's an internal command. Uh, it actually builds the uh, Docker images, uh, which with some extra meta information, it goes into our Docker repository, and a deployment to any of our Mesos clusters or environments would involve just a manifest change. Um, so they would have a file. Um, I'll show you contents of this file later on. Um, say change the so for example, if I want version 0.1 to run in the North America cluster. Um, and the uh, London cluster, all I needed to do was to change the uh, contents of this file um, and the uh, SU service would do the rest. All right. um, the, the other um, motivation for having a central uh, deployment system like this was so that we could have governance in, t in terms of um, knowing what was being deployed what the uh, versions are. So the uh, security teams would probably have hooks in there that could look at you know, versions of libraries being packaged in um, if there were some of them were out of date. Uh, we could also get statistics based on deployments. We, uh, if something broke on our website, um, having a global deployment manifest would show, OK, what were the uh, three last changes that went into um, the open, open table site? So this made made a, a lot of sense for us. Um, now, this is what a global deployment file looks like. Um, so there you can see in the uh, top line, it's just the service name, emails of people of the uh, services, uh, similar to the uh, VAM um, deployment um, file. Um, and there we would have uh, different clusters, um, instance types, um, memory, um, thresholds that we need to have. But the other thing that we added in there is the ability to add monitoring as well. So with this single file, you get to define versions of your um, code that you want in the environment. You, you specify number of instances that you want. You specify the types of monitoring that you want. Everything was automated then. And then we get to this. So with Su, with all those automated monitoring, uh, metrics collection, this is where we got to. 
Um, so with all this effort that we put in to make everything easy for developers, um, the pickup of using Mesos was really high. Everyone wanted to move to Mesos because of this, because um, previously they were writing lots of puppet code to do all the uh, plumbing. But by moving to Mesos, all they needed to do was have code and a central um, single deployment file. Um, so that was one of the main um, high points of um, our Mesos deployment. Um, the last thing that uh, I want to talk about is uh, logging and how we do logging. Um, so one problem we had with uh, microservices was everyone was logging on their own. Uh, different teams had different standards. Um, there was no consistency. For example, restaurant underscore ID um, is actually logged by one team. And then in the next team, it's called RID. In another team, it's called REST ID. So it can be you know, a, the same field can be named differently. Um, the other example as well is uh, for field types is um, if you're logging duration, for example, how long an, a request took. Um, th the name of the field could be the same. It could be duration. But one team could be using milliseconds. The other team could be using seconds. So there needed to be a way to standardize all of this if we were going to make full use of the uh, logging data and make sense of it. Um, so what we did was create a global unified data model for logging. Um, we also built a central logging system based on Logstash, Kibana, um, uh, Kafka. Um, anyone who wanted to use the uh, central logging system would need first to define a logging schema. And this was how, and that logging schema uh, needed to be reviewed um, before it got accepted. Um, but what that does it, is it allows us to ensure the uniqueness of the fields. Um, it allows us to ensure that all the fields um, match one another. And from there, we get to build um, really cool stuff because then we had um, fields that match. We could, we could see a request ID from one service going on to the next service. Um, all those match. OK. Um, so um, every request that goes into an open table um, has a specific request ID. It's ac actually a UUID. And we use this request ID to track um, the response onto every microservices that we have. So we built this tool called Timeline. It actually sh shows the uh, request going onto different microservices. Again, it's open source. You know, feel free to go out and have a look if you want. Um, and a request that comes into the open table website uh, we can look at it in terms of timeline. So here you can see those green bars are when you know things actually hit the service on the uh, left. So I'll do a quick demo of this um, after, you know, after the stock. Um, but what that allows us is to identify bottlenecks in services. For example, if you look at the graph here, you can see a bit of white space on the left. Um, you know, why, why does that service start only after 70 milliseconds? And then you can see those two long bars there. You know, those are probably uh, candidates for optimization. So having um, tools like this allows teams to actually go in and look at dependencies between services, as well as how to optimize services. All right. Oh, actually, it's the uh, it's demo time. So I'll quickly. So this is the Open Table website. Okay, I'm going to share something with you. You can actually s tell everyone that it runs of Mesos because if you scroll down to our website, bottommost, it's a trick. You highlight the invisible down there. 
you can actually see Mesos there. It runs on Mesos Slave32 slash dash prod, right? And in this request down here, we have the um, version names, the uh, bills. Um, but the important thing I want to show you guys is the uh, request ID. So anything that comes into our OpenTable website, we have a unique ID down there. So I'm going to take the uh, request ID from down here. And I'm going to paste this in our timeline tool. Oops, sorry. It's the uh, resolution. Okay. There you go. Um, so it's real time. There you can see uh, the services are on the uh, left, and just a hit on a single website uh, involves quite a few microservices. So you can see different restaurant APIs, reviews API, and clicking on one of this would actually show, you know, the uh, log string that was used to generate this. Um, so using this tool, uh, teams can actually um, see what the uh, bottleneck is if the uh, website is low. Um, it even, if you scroll down to this, it even has lo logs. Um, you can find logs okay, by clicking on this. So if I go up here, all right, based on this, we know where the uh, log files are. Um, we know which Mesos host it ran on. Um, various things like this. So, so having a global schema for logging allows us to build like, fancy tools like this. Um, oh, resolution is very small. Sorry about the uh, resolution. I mean, this site actually shows um, open table reservations on um, happening in real time. But as you can see, um, resolution is a bit small. But um, it's it's a global map that shows all the uh, reservations. Even now, you can see uh, multiple reservations coming in from North America and different countries. Yeah. All right. So um, key takeaways um, when deploying Mesos in the um, environment is map out the uh, developer workflows, um, constantly look for opportunities on how to standard standardize, automate, and enhance. Uh, make metrics and monitoring part and parcel of the uh, Mesos service. That's how you get you know um, quick adoption of Mesos. Uh, at least for us, that works quite well. Um, the engineers don't always make the best choice out of resource usage. Um, help them make an, an informed choice with uh, metrics and monitoring and the uh, tools that you can build. And having a common deployment pipeline um, allows us to build various tools that could hook in and standardize those microservices in terms of security, standardization. Um, also, finally, a global um, data model for logging um, allows us to make um, consistent um, analysis because the, the, the fields are consistent and allows us to build tools on top of it that you know makes analysis and troubleshooting much much easier um, so that's the end of my talk uh, I'm gonna leave a bit more time for Q a um, if you guys want Hi. Um, hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Jay. Uh, I always ask this question now. How did you solve your database problem? Da database problem? Yes. Um, how does that work in your whole self-provisioning, uh, teams run their own things, uh, Mesos world? OK, so um, for database, we haven't looked at persistent storage yet. So um, data um, our databases still run off the great puppet code base. Um, but we're looking into persistent storage in the coming future. For example, um, one candidate is our Redis um, 
instances that we have. So we, we're looking into that first. And they would run on your cluster? Yes, that's what okay. we're looking at right now, but they currently don't. Clear answer, thanks. <laughs> Hey, um, thanks for the talk. Um, how have you found Singularity? Can you maybe tell us a bit about how you've used it? Um, like any war stories or, um, yeah. Yep, just sure. Um, so, the, I mean, you, the use of Singularity goes back a long way. I mean, it's back in 2014. So at that time, we evaluated quite a few frameworks. Um, and Singulari Singularity, um, did seem the easiest of all the uh, frameworks. Plus, um, the developers at HubSpot who developed Singularity were um, very close to um, our core uh, platform uh, team. Uh, they, they were the guys that uh, brought in Singularity. Um, in terms of use of it, um, we found it um, easy. I mean, the interface is really easy. Um, the APIs are great. Um, and it's working out for us. Um, so we, we have no, we, we are co of course, we, we're evaluating Marathon and things like that. But um, as of today, um, we haven't found a need to change from Singularity to something else. Um, just a like very brief follow up. Um, could you give me like some picture of the scale of the number of apps that you're running under each like Singularity. Do you have like a Singularity instance per Mesos cluster, and how many apps or tasks are you roughly managing? If, right. you, if you can share it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think on the uh, smaller clusters, um, so all all our clusters run a single instance of um, Singularity. Um, actually, sing, run single instance, but three three nodes of Singularity in there. Um, uh, the size of I think. These, so it scales quite a bit because, as you know, Valentine's Day, we go quite big, but we've gone up to a um, hundred, so it, it will be probably about 800 slaves, um, probably during Valentine's Day, we go up to 800, 900 slaves per cluster. Um, the amount of um, services uh, would probably be in the range of 120, um, which, and it would be about two to 3,000 tasks running. Yeah, those are rough numbers because you know, depending on the uh, time, you know, we do scale quite a bit up and down. Great, right. thanks very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>